thank you all so much for joining us. We're really excited. We've all had a ton of Bumblebee questions and are just so grateful for Terry for being involved in the project and willing to present about Northern Illinois bumblebees and the Rusty Patch bumblebee. Um, as a lot of you know, this is a part of the Evanston Host Plan Initiative, uh, which is a part of Natural Habitat Evanston's Native Flowers for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee Projects. So we're inviting people to grow host plants for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, which is endangered. And you'll learn a lot more about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee in this presentation. And we're asking folks to grow the host plants and to take pictures of plants and bees and upload them into my naturalist. Terry has generously volunteered to review the bee photos on iNaturalist to confirm whether or not we actually see the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, it turns out bee identification is a little challenging. So <laughs> we'll learn more about that today too, but uh, we're really excited to have the support. And Leslie, I will pass it off to you for introductions. Yes, so Terry is a naturalist. He focuses on insects with a specific interest in bees. He contributes uh, identification to bee spotter and to surveys of prairies locally, including at Fermilab, uh, James Watt Woodworth Prairie Preserve in, in Glenview, which is pretty close to us. And mm -hmm. y'all should visit that in, on a Saturday morning. It's only open certain times. At Snuffy's Prairie in Dundee Township, which I don't know. So Terry maybe will tell us more about that. Please go ahead, Terry. Hi, uh, pleasure to meet you. My name is Terry Measley, as, as mentioned. Um, I am an amateur enthusiast about these uh, these bees since we bought a house here in Dundee 20 years ago and um, started noticing more and more. As a kid, of course, I was, was interested in insects and everything, but uh, I started noticing that there's more than one kind of bumblebee back then. And like, wait, there's, there's more than one kind of bumblebee. So that's where it started out and I'm trying to find resources. And uh, we'll talk about some of the resources later on some of the things that are available to help you out uh, to learn more. So yeah, I've been getting out into the prairies um, for, for semi-formally at Fermilab since uh, 2014, doing data there. Last year, I did none. Um, it is a bit of a drive, so I haven't even been down there this year. I'm not sure if we can get down there, uh, if, if it's open to the public yet or not. But once it is open to the public, actually go down there and check it out. They've been doing some phenomenal work. Um, and as I mentioned, Snuffy's Prairie here in Dundee Township is part of the old Raceway Woods property, and they're turning that into a little oak savanna. So it butts up against some private property and some roads, but um, I've disturbed all kinds of things there, from coyotes to deer to, um, to watching some hawks hunt as well. That was pretty interesting. Uh, it's not huge, but most of these areas aren't huge. They're kind of scattered around, and that's part of the problem. So let's move on. Um, to what I do. And this, this picture was taken out there at Fermilab. I do, as mentioned, some formal monitoring. Um, actually, I think I talked about all of this. So I am doing identifications for bee spotter. That's new uh, over the last couple of years. Um, everyone can contribute, and that's what we call citizen science. Um, a lot of people don't realize most field work has really been dominated by amateurs or just enthusiasts. Uh, and they can specialize and get out there a lot more than the professionals. Uh, university professors and others like that don't always have the time to get out there as much as they do. And when they do, it's, it's an event they get out with, um, with students and such. But if you're near a property, you can be out there a lot and just bring data out. And data is data. As long as it's formatted the right way, it's always useful. I mostly send to bug guide. I don't do it much at all yet with iNaturalist. I probably should, um, but I don't, usually don't use it with my cell phone. So it's, it makes it a little bit more tricky. These pictures were taken, the um, little specialist bee there um, on Spring Beauty at Fermilab. The uh, damselfly is a fragile fork tail. That was either at my house or at Fermilab, I don't remember. And this is a prairie cicada. It's a rare, very rare species. And that's, yeah, so the best camera is the one you've got. My cell phone's a little bit older, so it doesn't have as nice a camera as the new ones do. Um, it still does okay. It does okay enough for, for identification, especially for bumblebees. Um, video can help too, because 
trying to time a shot sometimes doesn't work very well. Uh, the video you can take and you can slowly go through frames and such and try to get the images. Uh, and then pull a couple frames out if you're going to send the information up to somewhere like iNaturalist or B-Spotter because they don't want video. Well, maybe I can start with a question if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think the likelihood is that we would actually see a rusty patch one of, if, we're, if we're sort of watching doing this project in the next few months? That it's, if they're out there, you'll see them now. Um, now. Okay. So I always see the males on Joe Pie Wheat. And that's another thing is the males and females might not have uh, use for the same flowers. Females need the pollen, males just need some juice. So, um, but it does show you that they're out there, that there is a colony that is producing. Um, so there, that's a good information. It's always best to find workers, but, um, you know, I, at least Monarda and, and Joe Pie, we will bring in, so will Culver's Root, things like that. And females will use Culver's Root too. Mm -hmm. And you think in Evanston, closer to the lake is, is okay as, as a habitat? I mean, that we might see them over here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no reason they wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, especially the more established suburbs, if you've got some open parkland area that doesn't get, you know, raked severely, uh, there's a chance that they would establish nests in those kind of areas. So I live along the river, so there's a lot of open area there. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this is the time of year where they are. So they're not considered an early species. You've got things like Bamaculatus and Oricomus and such that are early in the season. And then it transitions into Impatiens and Rufusinctus and, uh, and, uh, what else is out there? The, um, well, the Affinis. Um, so if you're going to see them, it's, it's this time. And then when do, when does their season end more or less? Essentially, when it's too cold, you can see, I've seen males out in October. Um, they're hanging on, hoping for their chance. It's probably too late by that point for them. Because the guines have already come out and made it and are looking for their spots. But they will continue to, to gather and fatten up for the winter. All the, the mated females, the foundresses. Yeah, so at that point, you're on the, um, the season of the asters, all those little aster family plants. Uh, and that's where you'll find them most of the time. Hi, I have a question. I'm Allison. I grow wildflowers at the farmer's market here in Evanston. Yeah. Can, can you just review like what um, uh, you've mentioned a couple of good uh, plants, but you know, uh, can you give us kind of the, a, a more complete listing of what uh, what flowers we might be looking for right now that are most likely to have a rusty patch bumblebee? It's generally going to be flowers that have, uh, that aren't very long tubular flowers. If you look at things like turtle head and um, the digitalis family plants like, um, like penstemon and what's, what's African, lobelia and such, those are usually longer than a finis is going to use. Uh, they need the, the, the long tongue bumblebees to, get in that or the small tiny bees last year blossoms and such they just crawl right in um, males sometimes will will be nectar thieves on those though so they'll they'll slice the back open and just suck right out of the pollen the um, nectarium or whatever it's called so um, I would look at things like culver's root like the asters sunflowers um, all all the sunflower family plants um, what else? Oh, things like like um, ironweed. Um, those are in aster. That's an aster as well. Um, aster, ironweed, and Joe Pie will draw a lot of stuff. Okay, I posted the host plant list in the chat oh, good. for people to check out. But there's 38 of them, and I was also curious how they landed on that list, and if you think there are some that. I mean, you listed some that are more likely for us to see. Yeah, you know, I, I'm only going off what I've seen them using and what's out there. Um, so these are these are all by pictures. If you see if if somebody has submits pictures of females gathering pollen or they've trapped 
bees and taken the pollen and examined it, that would tell you definitively if that's a plant that they're gonna use. But bumblebees are pretty generalists. They tend, I don't know that there are any specialist bees in that group at all. So it's more physiological than it is. Um, now they may have preferences. You know, there one thing that was kind of, kind of odd, actually a few things that are kind of odd on the um, Fish and Wildlife Service list is, is um, for example, New England aster. They call out New England aster and not <laughs> any other asters. And they call out Monarda fistulosa, which is a pretty common Monarda. But yeah. it's sort of surprising that they would call out particular types of Monarda or uh, to me or asters. What do you think about that? You know, it, that may simply be that that's what they have pictures and can prove. You know, so you see a picture of New, New England asters pretty distinctive. Uh, you get all these little hairy asters and smooth asters and such, and the flowers often look the same and you have to get good pictures of, uh, of the foliage to really know what it is. Um, and, and it may be that that's you know, just what they've, what they've been able to find. That would be my guess. So we do have a question. Do you know, know the ratio of males to females in the colony for the rusty patch? I don't know that. I don't think I've ever come across that information. It may be that because they, they are so hard to find these colonies and they're kind of tough to count too because the males are going to disperse as soon as they're out and they're not going to come home. So you can't just keep an eye on a colony and, and watch. So there's there's a few interesting things. Um, any, do you know how the the sex works for uh, for bumblebees? Is but a lot of insects, not all insects, but a lot follow an XO. So an unfertilized egg will only have one copy of the chromosome, an X, and it'll be an, a male. A fertilized egg, two X's, will be a female. So any worker can lay an egg, but it will be a male. Only if, only the, the queen will be able to lay a fertilized egg, because she can decide whether she fertilizes that egg or not. It's, it's a, there's a lot of animals that do that. They'll store the sperm for, ants will store the a queen ant can live 10 years or something. So are the territories the males are defending the ter colonies? No, the, the males have nothing to do with the colony. That's their territory. So if you go to some of these parks right now, you'll see the male oricomuses, and you'll be able to count them. You'll sit there by one and you'll see the next one 30 yards or something away. And they're, they're watching each other and they're, they're not happy that other guy is there. So if he gets too close, they'll they'll come out and they'll tussle and they'll come right back to their same perch. So their perch is often it's a high plant. So it's it's a uh, a sunflower or a, a compass plant or something like that. And he'll sit up there and he'll watch and he'll go out back and forth. Um, by mid afternoon, nothing's going to happen for that guy, so he's going to go to sleep. And he'll get up early and get right back to it. Yes, one person mentioned you read you mentioned you can see bees sleeping. Are there good times to go bee spotting? Maybe when they are asleep. I don't know. Yeah, so morning and that in evening. So like I say, they'll they'll be out there. So we've got some Monarda in the backyard and it's just full of male bombus um bimaculatus. There's some other ones coming in now too, but it's mostly those guys and they're just nectaring. You'll see them occasionally go at each other, but if if they're not acting territorial, it means they're not detecting the foundress, um, the gyne rather, the unmated females um, pheromones. So they're like, it's not worth spending that much energy, but they're still gonna be buzzing around and keeping an eye on things. And one person asked uh, who lives in Chicago that, you know, in a dense urban environment, um, will the rusty patch likely be found uh, if, if the person has the right plants? I know it was found near a metro station, right? I mean, so maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it all depends on how much they can get. Like, say, some of these colonies are pretty small, but rusty patches, the ones that have been found have all been pretty big. Uh, so that takes a lot of resources. So down in the urban areas, I doubt it. 
you'll probably see more like the um, the most common ones, the bimaculatus and the impatiens down that way. But you get out a little bit into the suburb areas, and that's really what looks like it's going to be the bastion for hope for this species, or it's the suburbs, because it's not farmed. Um, most of them are fairly established, and there is there is space. But what that means, though, is that they are in pockets, and that's never good for a population. And I'm worried about pesticides in suburbs, to be honest, though. Yes. We use so much pesticide on lawns. Yep. At James Woodworth Prairie, which is a little five-acre remnant. Some of it is Class A prairie. It has never been plowed. It's been built on, but it's never been plowed. Uh, so these ones come out, um, they're probably done already this year. They're a very short mating and distribution period. Here we go. I want to go over just a little bit of science here for people who don't know too much about it, and then we'll get on to the identification and such. So these are, in essence, vegetarian wasps. They split off the um, social wasp group about 100 million years ago, same time ants did. Um, and when you think of honeybees, which most people think of as having bee characteristics, they act more like ants than they do the other bees. Uh, and then the other wasps are all over the place, right? They can be parasitic, they can be hemiparasitic, they can be predatory. Um, but bees do the same thing, they just bring pollen and nectar back instead of insects and spiders and such. These are the families. We have all of them here except for one family. Um, that only exists in Australia. Uh, we also don't have a lot of uh, some of the ones that uh, are down in the desert. We have about 400 species in this region, the lower Lake Michigan region, uh, as of the last census that was done. That sounds about right. There's about 2,400 in the US. And some of them are pretty specialized for terrain. I'm not gonna go over this right now. Um, you guys can look up bumblebee biology if you, if you want, it can take a bit more time. So we'll get right into identification. And bees are after pollen. So if you go where the pollen is, you should find the bees. Like this one who's covered with pollen from something. I don't know, it's not goldenrod. On Bee Spotter, there's some information for you, uh, some identification guides that are very useful. I've I've saved them on my phone and I refer to them all the time. It gives you all the basic characteristics um, for the most common color patterns. And this is what we want you to look for when you're out in the field. If you're taking pictures, I want everybody to gather these pieces of information. So antenna segments, males will have 13, females will have 12. You often don't get good enough pictures for that. Males have huge eyes, females less so. Uh, males are often hairier because they have more testosterone and they have a pale clypeus. So those are all some very good identifi identifiers for male. Uh, they also, for bumblebees, make it easier that they don't have the big pollen basket on their tibia. Now for species, um, there's several things. They've got a little mohawk. The mohawk can be black or it can be pale. That's in one piece of information. The color pattern on the thorax is useful. It can be a little variable, but it's still useful to have. Then of course the abdomen, each of these segments is called a tergite and they have a color pattern. So for this guy, it's a black tergite followed by two yellow, then, then the rest of them are black. He's a male, he's got a mohawk. So this is a Bombus oricomus. These are the big bumblebees you see around, the size of the carpenter bees, if you ever get to see them. They're hard to miss. And they, this is also behavior. He's defending his territory. He's going to chase off anybody else. I've seen him chase goldfinches away. It's just amazing. Uh, size doesn't matter that much for most bumblebees. Um, for the larger colonies, they will make workers of different sizes, all depending on how much food they got as a larva. One thing to remember is there's more than one bumblebee out there that has brown on the abdomen. The most common one you're gonna see, especially early in the season is Brombus griseocolis, and it has a crescent. You can see the first tergite, 
is all yellow, and then it's a crescent of brown. There's no yellow on that second tergite. They're pretty consistent, so you can usually get a good identification on these. But here I'm trying to get at least a couple different photos. I'm going to try to get the head as well, so I can see if he's got the uh, that mohawk. So Bombus Affinis wants to do the same thing. The head is black, but mohawk is black on it. It's a black band usually. It's not just a little spot, um, but it, it can be a, a bit more of a spot. Whereas Aracomus, if you look back up here, we go back to Aracomus, has a, usually it's a line. So that's a different difference there. So these are all the pieces of information. They, you can just see that yellow, that brown crescent in the second tergite um, of yellow. So uh, this is pretty definitively a, a bompus affinis. Uh, you want to try to get several angles on the pictures. The more you get, the better. Which is the rusty patch. I just want Yes, to... I'm sorry. Yeah, the rusty patched. Yeah. I never remember the common names for them. <laughs> uh, here I'm trying to get different angles for the same one. So this one has a very clear view of that color pattern. But you see at this, at this angle, that first target doesn't seem to have a lot of color left. Um, they can get worn down. You'll see them pretty beaten up over time. So remember each of these individuals as an adult flying bee only lives about four or six weeks. So here's, Griseocolas versus Affinis in a similar pose. Um, you can see that big pollen ball on the Griseocolas, and uh, you can tell the differences between them pretty closely. Another one you'll see out here uh, is Bombus rufus cinctus. Um, they are in a different family of bumblebees than the Affinis, uh, so they do look a little different. They tend to be little butterballs, um, and it has two yellow followed by brown sometimes. Not always. Uh, they're pretty variable, but you can usually tell enough between them because the first two tergites will be yellow. Sometimes they'll have no color, sometimes they'll be brown, sometimes they'll be spotty. Um, you'll get used to it. Once you get out there, and I want to make sure you know this, once you get out there and start seeing them and start getting some, some experience doing it, you'll start to tell them pretty, qu pretty quickly. You'll be able to tell the difference between them. In the area here, we have 11 species of bumblebees uh, that have been seen, um, some not as regular as others. Uh, these are some of the common ones you'll see. And if you get out in the gardens and in other areas in the evening, you'll see bumblebees sleeping. Those are the males. They don't get to go home. They have to camp out. So. It's really a, often a really good way to get species uh, is just by seeing what's asleep in the morning. Uh, impatience is the most common late, spe uh, late season one. They have one tergite yellow, uh, the rest is black. Um, early on in the season, it's Bombus bimaculatus, the two spotted bumblebee. And it has, kind of, I don't think I have a picture of her. That's an oversight on my part. Maybe I edited it out. Um, Bombus fervitus or fervitus is a fun one though. They're all yellow. Well, it's only the last tergite that's black. Now they can be confused with the male uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus, which is rare in our area. Although um, down at the Field Museum and Shedd Aquarium, they do have them in that garden area there. <clears throat> so maybe it's the last vestige of them here, or maybe they're slowly coming back into the area. We don't know. I've never spotted one out this way. There are mimics. There's plenty of flies that mimic bumblebees. Um, these are all flies. So two of them are robber flies. And the third one up top is more like a hummingbird. It's a parasitic fly that lays its eggs in wasp and fly nests and things like that. Some of the other ones are confusing too. Um, I get confused by some of these andrinas on the big picture on the top right. Uh, I thought it was a bumblebee, but you can tell by the way it loads its pollen, not in baskets on the final, on the hind leg, 
but in scopa spread across the legs. Um, bumblebees don't do that. So I should have known that right away. Um, this time of year on that little sunflower plant there, you'll see a lot of longhorn bees. They're a lot of fun. Um, you'll see them sleeping, the males uh, defending territory a lot, and then just they sleep together. It's funny, they'll fight all day and sleep together all night. And then leaf cutters are a lot of fun too. There's the mega Kyle family. Some of them are very, very showy. That's the male and female of the same species. A lot of bumblebees, a lot of bees don't have a lot of sexual dimorphism, but the leaf cutters often do. So why Bombus affinis is endangered? If you haven't done a lot of reading, there's a lot of it is habitat loss, but it's more than just that. Um, they have a large um, nest size. They have like 200 active bees uh, during the season. They, and the colony can produce up to a thousand through the year. Um, that takes a lot of territory. So it means that they have to spend a lot of time um, traveling around to gather a lot of material and each colony will take a little bit more space. Um, but there was a population crash. They used to be a very common bee. Um, one interesting thing on global warming is that bumblebee territories seem to be compressing from the south, but they don't seem to be tracking all that much farther to the north. So that's, that's a concern that will lead to uh, fragmentation. And uh, one of her sister species, uh, Bombus franklinii, is probably extinct. So when I say there's different families of bumblebees, there's a few in this family and franklinii is, is one of them out west. Uh, they were hit really hard by this introduced mite uh, that came in with it commercially reared bumblebees. Um, so that's a big thing, but probably even more so is, is just the loss of territory to farmland and uh, all the pesticides used there. And this is, again, the same thing. So what we can do is we can, we can get out there and look and see what's out there. And uh, then strategies can be developed for protecting that area. And that's uh, US Fish and Wild Service is in charge of that. Again, um, they're notorious for having very well hidden nest sites. Uh, I've seen other nest sites for other bumblebees, but uh, apparently these guys are really well hidden. They also have a short tongue. Bees can have long tongues or short tongues. This is a short tongue bee. So it competes with honeybees, which also have a short tongue. Um, fragmentation is, is the biggest thing though, but bees can fly, so they can avoid some of that fragmentation. Let me go into a little bit of the range map. This is 2020 data uh, for sightings. If you look at the lighter area in the light green, that's historic range. And this is what was cited in 2020. Um, this is what's in our area uh, for um, 2018 on Bee Spotter. And this map here has a lot of information to unpack. So the line shows that same um, historic area, but it has several different layers of sightings here. So the little black dots are pre-2006. The red dots are 2006 to 2012. And the pluses are records since, um, since 2012. Uh, so you can see uh, the cer little circles are other species. But uh, they have, they're not in much of their historic range anymore, especially out east. I mean, look at that. It's, it's, it's been, uh, been devastating for them out there. Oops. And it coincides with this map. And again, the, the outlines are the historic territories. Uh, and the two maps show 1995 pesticide use um, in these um, neonicotinoids primarily um, versus 2012. So just our over-reliance on this class of neurotoxins uh, is, is staggering. The, uh, it's a neurotoxin that affects the neurons of smaller animals and invertebrates primarily. So while it doesn't harm mammals that much, 
it would just, it devastates insects and makes them unable to live essentially. It doesn't kill them outright, it just makes them um, unable to carry out life, which is the same thing. You'll see a lot of names uh, for it. There's some of the trade names there. Um, seeds are often coated with these, so then it becomes endemic in the plant itself, uh, which is the worst possible thing. So if you can buy, if you want to buy seed uh, plants, get them from your uh, na the plant sales, from um, native plant sales. Native plants are going to be the best things anyway. Um, they're, they're what the, the bees need, essentially. And that's some of what you can do here. If you need to use pesticides or herbicides, do it intelligently. Use it on the plants when they aren't in flower because the bees are not interested in the plants when they're not in flowers. I'm trying to eradicate some trumpet vine, which is proving just almost impossible. Um, even cutting the, uh, the stems and uh, coating them with some Roundup isn't doing the job. So I'm gonna have to see what else I can do. Um, other than just keep cutting it down. Uh, that was that was in here when we moved in and it's been, I've been kind of fighting it for the last five years. Spread the word is the big thing though. Uh, and a lot of villages are doing great job. Carpentersville um, near us and West Dundee is doing a great job. East Dundee doesn't have quite the, the budget for it, um, but the other two are, are planting a lot of good stuff and they're maintaining it. So make sure the local politicians know you notice that and approve of it and maybe share pictures with them. Get out there and see what's going on. And again, we have to be politically active. It's up to us to fight for these critters. And in our yards, the biggest thing we can do is leave some mess. So all of these insects rely on just leaf litter that they live in um, over the winter time. And if you see a butterfly in early spring on those cherry trees and such, it overwintered as an adult down in the woods and in the leaves and that kind of such. It didn't overwinter as an egg or as a larva. It was already hatched. So like moaning cloaks and commas and um, admirals and such, those, those all are in that group. And, butter, and bumblebees are that way too. The queens are the only ones that live through the winter time. Uh, then they have to find a nest as soon as the spring starts. So, I'm promised some resources. I'll send a list out to this one as well. This Bees in Your Backyard book is fantastic. Um, it is one of the best books on bees that have probably ever been published. It's sort of a top to mid-level, um, but if you want to go deeper, you'll have to find other resources like the Bumblebees of North America there by, um, by uh, Robin Thorpe. The other one on the right bottom is an identification guide by Heather Holm. She just put out a wasp book too. Uh, the cool thing about this book is the first half of it is about the bees and how to identify and all that. And it has a really good guide for it. The second half is on the plants. And it has one of the, the prettiest and, and most information dense um, graphics for these plants that I've ever seen. Uh, it goes really in depth for, for what types of bees and what type of pollination and when it pollinate, you know, when it blooms and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's really fantastic books. If you're deciding what you can plant, this is what to do. Um, if there's one thing I can say about helping the queen bees is to have things that are blooming in the spring. Uh, the Andrina bees come out before anything's in bloom and they wait for the uh, the cherries and other uh, rose family trees to, uh, to bloom. And bumblebees are kind of like that too. They need something very, very early to survive. Uh, whether that is uh, the little woodland plants like uh, trout lilies and such, or in your yard, it can even be something like, uh, like what we call the weeds, the hen bits and things like that. Trees though are probably key. All of those early blooming things like willows, like the pussy willow tree, you'll see tons of stuff around that. Uh, maples, um, even well, oaks come later, bond, but anything that's blooming early, the bees and flies will find, and it's really useful. Plus, you don't have to replant it, you just have to keep it going. So, trees, guys, plant some trees. There's resources online as well, these all have good information for you. Um, to use 
just just do some digging on them. So this is all I've prepared. I can open for questions or I can talk about my equipment a little bit. What do you think, Libby? Uh, I think if you're willing to share about your equipment and then dive into questions, does that sound sure. good? Okay. Sure. Oh, and this, this little jumping spider is on a grass flower. It's pretty fun. <clears throat> so I'm in the field. I generally carry two camera bodies with me, uh, one with a 300 millimeter telephoto to get pictures at a distance. Um, anything beyond about six foot, it can do it. Its minimum focus is about six feet, which it's been more useful for insects than I would have thought. I usually brought it out for birds, but I wound up using it mostly on things like butterflies that don't want me to get too close to them. Uh, with the macro side, I have a 100 millimeter macro lens and I use a ring flash. Uh, I use the ring flash in manual mode. I use the camera in manual mode and there's the settings for it. Um, both of the cameras can use GPS tagging. So that's very important for me too. And um, I process everything in Lightroom. I use shoot raw so I can get the most information out of it. If I underexpose, I can draw much more information out of that. Um, it doesn't matter what brand of camera you have. Uh, if you have, go on the DSLR route, 100 millimeters is about what you want for insects. It gives you a bit of standoff and a lot of magnification. And everyone makes a good one. Canon, Fuji, Nikon, um, Sony, and, and the aftermarket ones, Tamron and Sigma, they're all good lenses. So don't be afraid to buy used if you wanna go that way. Uh, and you don't need a ring flash. A ring a flash helps, uh, but it also not has a max on its sync speed, synchronization speed with the flash. Um, but what I've found is it's good for fill light and it is really good at freezing motion. Um, motion is the biggest hazard to, to photography and it doesn't take a whole lot of motion to blur a photo. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, I talked about all this. All right, easy enough. Okay, wonderful, thanks so much, Terry. Sure. Do you, do you think iPhones are also, or just cell phones would also work well for- I do use cell phones, when I'm, especially if I'm out with the dogs or something, or, you know, the best camera is the one you've got. Let me, let me switch. Hi, it's Allison again. I have I have one more question. Um, I had sort of been using that fish and wildlife list as kind of a growing guide uh, for the plants I sell at the market here. Mm -hmm. And and I have them all categorized with a picture of the rusty patch bumblebee in the front uh, for people who are looking for that. And um, the number one plant it mentioned was the purple giant hyssop. And um, I was just wondering if, um, you know, what, what's unique about that plant and why that was kind of mentioned as the number one um, most important plant for the bee. Yeah, hyssops are interesting. Hyssops and salvias, there's some native ones, uh, but like anise hyssop is native-ish, I guess. Um, and it draws a lot of stuff. I've seen, I'll see the, um, the finish on that. I should have thought about that. It has very small flowers um, and those, that family of mints, I'm trying to remember the name of that family, uh, are known for just producing a ton of nectar and they have a very long growing cycle. So I've, our anise hyssop here is starting to bloom, uh, but it will be blooming yeah, well, in, well for a couple of, at least a month, blooms will be going. So that's useful too. Um, but mostly, I think it's nectar. I don't know that it's really a pollen plant for them. Yeah, I, I just want to throw in, like, I, you know, um, I keep having to ask Libby for more handouts on the bumblebee project. People are really interested in this and um, are really buying a lot of plants in hopes to attract one. So mm -hmm. it's it's cool. It's a nice uh, new new thing for people to be looking for yeah. other than other than butterflies, I think, you know, which yeah, are also milk, important. Yeah, you know, milkweeds are good too. Stuff like swamp milkweed and the little small milkweed. So they do both. Um, and unlike honeybees, the milkweeds can actually handle the pollinaria of, of, um, of milkweeds. 
bumblebees struggle with that. I mean, honeybees, rather. Honeybees struggle with it, but bumblebees are just fine with it. What do you mean no. the pollen area? I don't when know what- <laughs> Milkweed has, has its pollen in this little, little ball that has a stem on it. Um, it looks like a, like a little lollipop sort of thing. And when you come in, you, they grab it, the whole thing pops out. The whole thing comes out and uh, it's sticky. So it, and bumblebees are hairier, I guess, so they, they can handle that a little bit better. It doesn't stick to their body as much. Um, and that's how it pollinates it. It, 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 it. The plant wants that pollen area to be transported to another plant or pollinium, I think, something like that. I have to remember the words. My botany should be better than it is. <laughs> Terry, can you speak more about habitat connectivity needs for the plants? Uh, I've heard that the optimal jumping distance for the rusty patch is about 0.6 miles. And I was wondering if you can explain that a little bit more. Yeah, so they're, they're big bee large bees compared to some of these tiny ones. So their territory can be pretty big. They can travel miles if they need to. Uh, they won't prefer to though. It's kind of like a nesting bird. It doesn't want to go too far to find more caterpillars. So it doesn't want to go that far. It may not live, it may live in the, the woods or right on the edge of the woods because they usually take over old um, uh, rodent nests and such. Uh, but they'll have to travel out into the fields and the prairies to, to get the food they need. So 0.6 sounds about right. And they're not the smallest bumblebees, but they're not as large as say Oropomus. And the larger the bee has, the, the more energy reserves it can draw upon. Um, one interesting thing on that though, is that larger, a larger body can't hold, cannot tolerate heat as well as a smaller one. That's why most, these bee colonies will produce bees of different sizes. Smaller ones that can handle more, more heat, larger ones can handle more cold, and they may be active at different, different times of the day. But yeah, just because you find the bees doesn't mean the nest is all that close to home. Sometimes it is though. Uh, we'll have nests in the yard occasionally, uh, sometimes down where there was a tree and the roots are rotting away. So that's, I'm sure mice or voles or something were living down there. At least that's what my dogs say when they dig it up. Um, do you have any other um, tips for just how to manage your own yard at home in order to support bumblebees? The best thing you can do is have stuff growing all season long. So something that's out early so we have um, a plants, we have water leaf. Water leaf is great. It draws the earliest of the bumblebees. The queens will find that. Um, another one that's been really successful for us is, Sol um, is um, Jacob's Ladder and Solomon Seal. Um, I've got to get some weeding done because all this stuff comes up, but we've got some bellwort and things like that. Or yeah, bellwort. Um, that seems useful too. And that's that's all done by this time of year. The plants, the vegetation's all done. Um, but try to have peaks and try to have not just one or two of anything, but have clusters of flowers um, to have enough resources that they want to come back and, and use it. Um, they may never find a single plant, but they'll find groups of them. Um, what else is useful? Um, the biggest thing for the queens is just to have stuff super early on. Um, and in, out in the prairies, things like shooting star, um, like wood betony is super early. Um, some of the buttercups and marsh marigolds, things like that. Those are really early. Those are tough to grow in the yard though, I think. But zizia is easy enough and that blooms pretty quick. Uh, geranium, geranium maculatum. That's, that's really nice. And then later in the season, um, you know, the asters, you, you'll have goldenrod and ironweed and stuff like that that are super easy to grow. In fact, they can, like Monarda, they can start taking over if you're not careful. 
Do you, do you have any tips in terms of like um, whether whether you should leave parts of your yard, uh, parts of your ground uncovered by mulch and things like that? I mean, um, or like uh, leaving um, a little bits of rotting rotting wood or stumps in your yard rather than having stumps removed, things like that. Yeah. So yeah. I have seen plenty of but of, of uh, bumblebee nests in rotting stumps. Um, anywhere that you're going to get a hollow, and it's usually like say it's old mouse and, and vole and other nests. Um, that's what they're after. They won't reuse that though. So once that's there, it's pretty fouled up, and they won't come back to it. Um, but that rotting stump does a lot more than just support a nest site. Um, there's a lot of things that eat that wood that are highly beneficial and stuff that eats the things that eats the wood that are highly beneficial. Um, it's all part of the same uh, big ecosystem. For um, other nesting sites, for other bees, yeah, uh, they all have slightly different strategies. So if you have real sandy soil, you may get Kalides coming in and nesting there. Um, if you have just a little bit of open ground, you might have some of the Andrina species coming in and out. And you may not ever notice them, but if you can just leave it there, uh, a thick layer of mulch is a bad thing because most of these bees aren't going to be able to get through all of that. It kind of hardens down to a cement and they can't get through it. Um, and you're also going to be supporting stuff like all the larvae, the beetle larvae and the fireflies and everything else that lives down in that nest too. So leaves, just leaves they can handle. They can get through that. Maybe also a link to identification. I know Libby, you have some of those um, posted, but I mean, if there are, you know, particular resources that we might share um, that help with identification, that would be good to know. Because yeah. in reality, it's kind of a, you know, take a photo and look at it thing instead of like retaining um, ID information. I yeah, I, I reference back to those bee spotter guides all the time uh, to remember which one has a, a black mohawk which one does you know have have a yellow one that kind of thing it's like oh that's right it's this guy um there's some of the more unusual bees that are in this area um they take a little bit more work sometimes you can identify them sometimes not there's a parasitic bumblebee the citrinus that's kind of tricky to identify but i've seen them plenty of places and when you talk about flower clumps or clumps of the host plants do you mean like clumps of the same species or could it be a clump of like three different species? We've gotten that question a lot. Uh, if they're closely related, like I have two different species of liatris in the yard. We got the, the prairie blazing star and the rough blazing star, I think. Um, they're starting to get edged out. So I gotta, I gotta work at that. Um, but yeah, if you have rather than one or two of, of this or that, having a whole bank full of Zizia, the golden Alexander, or, and a whole bank of, or, or a bunch of like Culver's root or something spread around so that those erupt and now you've got a dozen of them or so. And then later on in the season, they'll be down and then something else will be shooting up in the same spot. That's how it works out in the wild. Um, eventually things that like, um, some of the coreopsis that rely on like um, disturbed ground, they may start to die down because the ground's not getting torn up and something else may edge in on them. So it takes maintenance. But yeah, if you can have a, have them grouped together, it's always better because the bee's going to go in and go from this one, this one, this one, this one real quick instead of going, you know, across the yard and then trying to find another one. It may not bother with it. And they can tell, they can tell when the resources, when the, the pollen has been, or the nectar has been, um, been consumed. They'll tell pretty quick, they'll land on that plant, give it a good feel and then take off if there's nothing there for them. So one person asked about uh, the identification chart. I don't, I'm not exactly sure I know what she's talking, which chart she's talking about, but maybe um, 
too. Yeah, let me grab it. I can grab a link to it. And and then it also says, don't bumblebees visit the same species sequentially? Like, won't they go all around to all of the Menarda first or something like that? They will. They will know essentially when the plant should have nectar, and they'll go to those plants, and then um, they'll come back to it. So there are studies about that. Let me grab this. There's um, studies on the economics of it and whether it's worthwhile for the bees to go out to the areas or not, because they have to make a lot of decisions. It's a lot of energy. I think it's, um, um, i trying to remember his name, faulty memory, Golson out of England has written a bunch of books on bumblebees and one of them is bumblebee economics, where they study just that. You know what what does each bee have to do and how do they tell each other what's going on because it's not like the the honey bees that do the waggle dance sort of thing and even that's a little questionable sometimes um, but they know where the stuff is they know where to go back to it so once they've mapped the area and they know what's in bloom they'll know they may scatter around scouting but then once they've mapped that spot They'll go home and then later on they'll go right back to that spot and they know when the, it's it's fascinating because each of these is an individual and has to learn all of this stuff for themselves but they learn from each other too uh golson's group has done a lot of that too where you see bees that actually watch each other solve problems and then they go up and just do it right away like a pro we don't necessarily think of something with you know, this, this tiny brain being able to do these kind of things, but they do. They're social insects. We, we do need to remember that. Um, yeah, they're fun to watch. They have personalities. Do they learn from other bee species or are they pretty much only communicating with their own? That's, I don't know that anyone has ever looked at that. Okay. Um, they're kind of the big, they're the big girls on the block though, you know, most of these other bees are far smaller than them. Carpenter bees are about the only ones that are bigger. And even so, Oricomus gets close to that size. But the big Xylocopa, they're, you know, you've seen them, they're the big ones that drill into your deck and such, they're inch, inch and a quarter long. Yeah. Some bumblebees are really, really small, they're like half an inch. Other ones aren't that size, though. So most of these other bees, I've got pictures of like three different sizes of bees on the same echinacea, the same comb flower. You know, the big bumblebee up top, then you got a Helictus legatus, which is about 10 millimeters or so. And there's a little tiny Hylaeus, and it's like four millimeters. And they're all just there. So they don't, bumblebee will muscle anything off, but the other ones don't really care. She's not attacking him. She's just, does she even really care that they're there? Probably not. Yeah, I saw milkweeds recently that had like eight different species that were all sharing the milkweed. Oh yeah. And yeah. the wasps will come to those milkweeds too because they, they drip. You've seen milkweed flowers and they just drip with all the nectar. Uh, so is there a ton of competition, like are there just limited amounts of pollen and nectar per day and how does the competition work? Um, it does, does everything. So if you think of those really tiny bees, they don't need as much, whereas those bumblebees, they need a lot. So even if it's past peak, if it's past peak for the flower, the bumblebee might not bother with it. It might land, give it a quick look and go not worth it and go off to the next one. Whereas a, a tiny Hylaeus or Lassia Glossum or some of these ones might go, oh, there's plenty here. I don't know what you're talking about. But you know, when something's that small, it doesn't need as much. Um, another good thing tip for you is if you, you have all these stalks out here, leave them up over the winter, let the birds get the seeds. So like Culver's root and such, you got the big seed stalks on it. Uh, collect seeds if you want. Uh, but in the spring, then cut them off about two feet or so or small enough, and you'll see those little twig nesting bees uh, find them and start building nests in those bees, in those twigs and stalks and everything else. 
They're fun to watch. Didn't you mention that because the Rusty Patch Bumblebee has a shorter tongue, it has more competition, which is why we need more host plants. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good one. Uh, it has competition primarily from honeybees, which are a short tongued bee species. And there's a lot of honeybees. Each colony, each nest of those can be tens of thousands of bees. So they, they strip an area of resources, which can push them off. What they can't do is they can't poll pollinate anything that requires uh, buzz pollination, and they can't access those long tubular flowers. Uh, but neither can the affinis. The affinis can buzz pollinate, but it can't access the long tubular flowers. Um, so that's the competition that comes in there. Not so much from the other native bees. They kind of stratify a little bit. Um, what else? So if you're going to over, if you want to really benefit the affinis, tend more toward the shallow flower plants. But that's easy. All the aster family plants are in that family. Wonderful. I just learned so much. <laughs> you, Terry. Um, I want to be cognizant of time, but if anyone has any last questions that you want to put in the chat or shout out, feel free. Can I ask one quick sure. last little question? What you just said about cutting off the uh, plant stems in the spring for the bees to move in and use mm -hmm. the tubes was interesting, but it made me think about that compared with the bee houses that you see for sale now. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any um, reading on the, the bee houses and whether those are actually beneficial to bees or whether it's really like uh, preferable to just um, let them find your your plant stems instead yeah, it's, it's going to be preferable to let them to get them something that's more natural to them so if you're cutting off stems um, a number of years ago i noticed them for the first time probably the little serotinas the small carpenter bees um, we used to have a bunch of raspberry plants and in the spring, you know, you're knocking, you're getting rid of all the dead stock and getting ready for the next, next batch. And I started noticing a lot of them had nests in them. It just were hollowed out. And it's like, so then I started keeping an eye on them. And I, it was about 30% of the dead canes had nests, serotonin nests in them. So then I just started, when I cut them off, I would just stack them off to the side because they were going to be done with that. They weren't going to reuse it. Um, and then well, this time of year, I got to get back out and, and cut them off after they fruit. You cut them off, and that's a really pithy stem. So they can just dig right down into it and they seal it off. And they'll have multiple generations a year. Those are multi voltine bees. Uh, a lot of them aren't. Um, but the problem with the big, especially the really big bee hotel things, is it invites pests and parasites. Um, and not just like wasp and fly parasites. Uh, but mites and such that can be really devastating. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to shy people away from those. I tried them once. Uh, the ones I got were Mega Kyle, uh, I forget what it's an it's a, a non-native one. They were the only ones that used it. Oh. I have had the experience that a um, a downy woodpecker clung to the side of my bee house. <laughs> and just methodically cleaned out every hole. <laughs> yeah. And it probably couldn't reach all the way in to get everything that might've been living in there, but it was, it was good to see <laughs> that that happens. You know? And it's a snack bar for them. My dad has an old um, cedar fence. I told him we should get rid of it. He goes, nah, the carpenter bees use it, keeps them away from the house. Plus I like to watch the flicker, the uh, red bellies get in there and just eat all the larva. <laughs> <laughs> there's buddies good to know thank you mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's kind of fun if you just sit out there and watch those little stalks um amidst the flowers eventually you'll you'll often see a bee go to it go down in and then come back out go feed somewhere because those ones usually stay really close and they'll um they'll defend that overnight and some, uh, some ground nesting bee species, uh, I think Kalides may do it, and some of the Andrinas do too, 
they'll share an entrance. So they'll have a single entrance that goes down the ground and they'll, they'll have condos that go off to the sides. So there's more than one bee coming in and out uh, and they can guard the, the entrance to keep the par uh, parasitic bees from going down in there and laying eggs in their nests. And they all have parasites. We have one last quick question in the chat, which is, will you provide more information about the prairies that you mentioned at the beginning? Yeah, so uh, Fermilab, natural, uh, Fermilab Natural Areas is the group that maintains all of Fermilab's uh, natural areas. Um, and it's a 10 square mile facility, Fermilab is. And they've got some old growth in there, some uh, undisturbed prairie and they've got reconstructions. Uh, if you go to, and you can't get at all of it, um, the stewards and others can get in to the restricted areas. But what's there is um, by the Liederman Science Center is the Pearson Interpretive Prairie. And that is extremely good. Uh, and it is adjacent to the big woods. If you wanna see the spring ephemerals, all these little flowers that pop up, um, that's a place to go. Uh, apparently, some woods up, up in uh, the north is a good one, too. Snuffy's Prairie is a, a section of the old Raceway Woods in Carpentersville. Well, part of it's Carpentersville, part of it's Dundee. It's all Dundee Township. Um, that was a racetrack up until, I, I think, the mid-70s. And it would held some big races. And then it's just been allowed to decay. Um, it has some good areas. The Snuffy's Prairie area is away from the racetrack itself, but it's part of that property. And they're turning that into an oak savanna. Uh, it even has a population of Michigan lilies in there, which is pretty cool to see. Um, it's bordered on two, two sides by roads and two sides by private property. So, um, and that woods, I think those woods are fairly low quality, but they're doing what they can. They just burnt almost all of it this past spring. And I was kind of surprised to see him do that much of it at once. Um, James Woodworth Prairie is in Glenview. It's near Gulf and um, Milwaukee. And it's bordered on one side by McDonald's, on one side by, uh, I think, Milwaukee Avenue, another side by one other big road, and then subdivisions. It was um, it was a, the private area, private land of a um, one of the Chicago um, um, uh, store owners, a big um, department store owner. And this apparently was his mom's favorite spot. So he, she forbade him to do anything to it because she liked to see the birds and the butterflies and everything else. As a result, there is still some class A prairie in that little five acre remnant. Uh, there's a swale in it. There's lady slipper orchids, there's all kinds of stuff. And it's owned by the UIC and the students and, and Alan Malumbi uh, maintain that with some other volunteers. So they get in there and they make sure that the gray dogwoods aren't taking over. And when they see different trees and tag them and make sure that they, they, they remove them. Uh, it doesn't get um, a lot of other things like deer and such because it's fenced off. So it's, it's kind of a weird little place that um, just, it, it resists a lot of change. It's pretty interesting. Uh, they can't, there's a lot they can't do from the university, but there's a lot they can do. Um, and there's, there's some stuff in there that they want to get rid of, and they've got to develop a plan to get rid of some of the stuff that's in there. But generally, it's so well established, it resists a lot of invasive stuff. And not that autumn olive hasn't been found there and eradicated, but you know, you just find it. Five acres, they can get pretty, pretty up and close to every piece of it. Uh, those are the ones where I've done the bulk of the, the photography work. Oh, very cool. Adding all mm -hmm. of that to my list. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry, you're getting so much praise in the chat. Uh, is there anything sure. else you want to, any parting? comments about bumblebees or the rusty patch bumblebee that you'd like to leave us with? Um, 
really the best thing we can do is is provide food for it and not and encourage our neighbors not to to plant just terrible multi-flora rows and boxwoods and put something good in we put a few button bush in as part of this planting we 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 saved up for years to do all this work in the yard um now i need help to weed it um but the button bush have been really good they've been really cool and then i think i've gotten i've gotten old rhododendron i think i'm gonna get rid of and put a button bush there instead too Okay. But our yard floods once in a while, so I got to make sure it can tolerate that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the trick. <laughs> cool. Well, we are so appreciative of the view. Yeah. Sorry, there's hawking outside my window. There yeah. actually, I live on the third floor of an apartment. There has been a bee. And you will, you will learn how to tell the difference between yeah. these bees just by getting out there, observing them, and spending the time to identify them yourself and yeah. take a guess. If you go to like Bug Guide, it makes you take a guess as to what it is in the title um, and then they'll do it and other thing there is useful to do is to subscribe if you look at the photos that are waiting for identification scroll through them and just subscribe to it oh that's a cool wasp i'll subscribe to that to find out what it is maybe make a guess so well yeah we've heard a lot of people say that they just like weren't really aware of bees until the season and now once we start looking we're seeing them everywhere so yeah it's got, a, got a new species in the yard this year. I may have misidentified one from one. They may have been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to remind everyone to sign up for the project if you haven't yet, evanstonhostplants.org, and take photos of host plants and bees. Um, Terry is going to be confirming whether or not we spot the rusty patch. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, you can also, as Terry mentioned, take videos and then screenshot those and share them. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'd like to give a great round of applause to Terry. Thank you so much. Sure, it's my pleasure. Anytime. Wonderful. Have a great day, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.